So why do people embrace stigmatized identities? Stanley Elkins probably would have argued that it's a consequence of intimidation and coercion that creates the so-called Sambo personality. Uh, in the Brazilian context, one could argue that there are incentives for embracing stigmatized identities with the onset or adoption of affirmative action. Uh, others might argue that it's cultural affinity, that individuals like the behaviors and norms that are associated with belonging to a particular group. Uh, this is oddly popular among many economists as an explanation. Uh, one could also argue, however, that it is a consequence of policing mechanisms that are internal to the group that maintain, uh, maintain this affinity. So uh, peer pressure and the like. Or finally, one might argue that it's because of political resistance to the conditions of inequality and oppression that lead individuals to strongly identify with a group, such as the argument made by Daniel Boyerin in his book, A Radical Jew, which is subtitled, Paul and the Politics of Identity. Exits do take place, however, particularly via processes of self-identification. People actually remove themselves from saying that they're part of a group. Duncan and Trejo's work has demonstrated that the claims about Chicano regression over multiple generations could be explained by the fact that a disproportionate number of second and third generation Chicanos in the United States actually no longer self-identify as being Mexican or of Mexican ancestry. And so as a consequence, they're removed from any estimates of the relative position of Mexicans to non-Mexicans in the United States. Uh, these are the kinds of questions that are central to the emerging subfield in economics that I've been heavily engaged with uh, called stratification economics, which is, uh, is obsessed, in a sense, with group identity and its consequences. It draws from sociology the notion of the group, both from the standpoint of self and social classification, where the group becomes the central agent for action, and it draws from economics an emphasis on notions of self-interested behavior. So stratification economics conceives of a world of self-interested groups where relative group position is of paramount importance, drawing heavily on Herbert Bloomer's old arguments about uh, group status and proprietary claims. If one were to say that the phenomenon of racial inequality could be explained along a continuum of factors that could be categorized broadly as structural or cultural, uh, stratification economics squarely lies on the structural side of the explanation. Indeed, in its focus on group-based inequality, it's critical for stratification economics to note that the group is salient for the construction of racial and ethnic disparities, but it's also salient for the remedies of ethnic and racial disparities. In effect, if one silences group identities, one silences attention to group-linked inequalities. Further, uh, stratification economics tends to locate the phenomenon of classification or categorization processes more heavily on the social classification side rather than the self-classification side, where social classification is seen as being more powerful in dictating life outcomes. We need to comprehend how people are seen by others to understand how people's lives might be shaped in their social context. So a conventional piece of wisdom is the claim that in Latin America, race is understood as something that is primarily phenotypical or gradational, while in the United States, it's understood as something that's more genotypical or discrete. Um, would argue that the evidence that's emerging from work that's related to the thrust of stratification economics suggests otherwise. Ancestry matters significantly in terms of race positioning in Latin America. I refer you in particular to Franz Twine's work and Robin Sheriff's work. But in the US, appearance matters in a critical way. Research on employment demonstrates that among Chicanos, more European-looking and lighter-skinned males have significant advantages in the labor market. Among blacks, lighter-skinned black males experience negligible discrimination in comparison with medium and dark-skinned black males. In marriage markets, lighter-skinned black women get married earlier and more often. And evidence suggests that biracial black women have uh, 
more affluent husbands, better educated husbands, and more than 50% of the women who report themselves to be black and white in the ACS in 2009 had white husbands. Third, uh, in the arena of criminal justice, Jennifer Eberhardt, who's at Stanford, has demonstrated that blacker looking males are more likely to get the death penalty for comparable, pen comparable crimes as lighter skinned black males. And finally, in the arena of politics, in Brazil, there's evidence that today, and this is, this is actually a departure from previous points in time, darker skinned candidates have more appeal to Afro-Brazilian voters, whereas in the United States, there's some evidence that darker skinned candidates have to deliver more right-wing messages to appeal more successfully to white voters.